Father, we thank you that we can look forward to the day when not just from the river to the sea, but from the river to the farthest ocean, to the isles of the world. No place will be exempt from the rule of the Messiah. Right now, as we look at the world, it's hard to envisage how that could happen. He will have to come back and show himself for who he is. And as we meet together here to worship you in his name, we realize that most of the people who live around us and who come here to vacation and holiday and to forget their problems have no notion of the coming of Christ to establish his rule, have no notion of his promise to return for the church, have no notion of his authority, and in many cases, even if they have heard of it, couldn't care less. Though we meet today because we do care and because we do want to be encouraged by these truths. And so help us as we look into your word to understand it and to apply it in the week that's ahead. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'd like you to listen very carefully to this description of future events. And I want you to tell me what is the religious group that teaches this. You ready? Before the last day, the Antichrist will come and faith will decay. Then Jesus will return, heal Antichrist, and reestablish faith. At the first blast of the trumpet, all living things will die. And after another interval, the second trumpet blast will bring all to life again before the judgment place. God will judge all people by what is in his book. Good deeds will be weighed against bad deeds. Those who do good according to the law will pass over the bridge. Those who have done evil will fall off the bridge into the fire. Those who enter heaven enter an eternal continuation of the physical existence of the Garden of Eden. Have you figured it out yet? Those who enter hell's fires experience an amplification of the worst imaginable physical horrors of this life. Unbelievers will suffer there forever, but believers who fall into the fire can be delivered through the intercession of... Who do you think? Fill in the blank. Any guesses? I know you're listening, but nobody dares. Would you believe Mohammed? Yeah, Islam teaches that Jesus is coming back. And so do many pseudo-Christian sects. Take, for example, the Mormons, who say that Jesus will return after the gathering of Ephraim, that is to say, American Mormons. In Zion, which is identified as Independence, Missouri. There's a replacement theology for you. <laughs> and there'll be a regathering of the Jews to Jerusalem. Or take the Seventh-day Adventists. When Christ returns, all believers in Ellen G. White's teaching since 1846 will be raised to witness the event. If you don't believe in Ellen G. White's prophecies in 1846, then maybe it's going to be different. Or take the Jehovah's Witnesses, who say that Jesus has no body now. 
And so his return in 1914 was invisible. His return was a second presence. And I don't know if you find that very convincing as a fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy that he was going to return. Who among all these groups is telling us the truth? What does the Bible say? Go back again to John 14. Let's just quickly review some of these passages. And this one we looked at last time we were together in the beginning of May. John 14, verses 1, 2, and 3. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Physical return. Visible return. At least to those who are those who are going to be taken to be with Christ. Um, how about in the book of Acts, just a few pages further, where we read that after Jesus gives the commission to his apostles in Acts 1.8. Actually, Acts 1.8 is more exactly a prophecy of what is going to happen. The, the command has already been given earlier in the 40-day period after the resurrection. Verse 9 says that when Jesus had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here, excuse me, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. You watched his body, we would say, I suppose, levitate. Don't try to do this. Ascend into heaven. They watched him go up. This is very roughly like watching airplanes fly off of the International Airport runway and gain altitude and disappear in the cloud. There it goes, I, I can't see it anymore. There was a physical event that could be witnessed by more than one person. This was not a group of men hallucinating. And the angel says that he's going to come back. That is, bodily, physically, visibly. <clears throat> when you come to Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter one, and verse 10, you see Paul making some encouraging statements to the Thessalonian believers with whom he had only been for maybe three weeks or so. And he encourages them and commends them for the example that they gave to many of the believing um, new Christians in that area of Macedonia and Achaia, who, he says in verse 9, they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turn from God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Many other passages could be cited. The Bible repeatedly claims that Jesus, the Messiah, will return. And this is unique, isn't it? Look for other religions who dare to make this claim and uh, say that they're going to follow through on the claim. But you know, there's been endless debate over the past 2,000 years about how this will occur, and of course, when it will occur. It hasn't yet. So the discussion hasn't just begun in the last uh, decade or so. It started almost 
immediately after the church began. When you read 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, you find out that in this little church, constructed of Jews and Gentiles who believed that Jesus was the Messiah and had begun to endure tremendous pressure and persecution, particularly in that city at the hands of uh, the synagogue, uh, there, there were letters circulating to the effect that the day of the Lord, the time of judgment and plagues, had already begun, or that it was imminent. And it, it was a letter signed with what looked like Paul's signature. It was a falsification. Strange. Here we are in the middle of the first century, and there is already debate about how one should interpret Jesus' prophecies about his return. So my friends, if this topic is confusing to you, and if you're tempted to say, you know, there's so many Christian denominations and they all take a different view on the return of Christ and last things, and uh, this debate has really kind of uh, kicked into gear since, you know, for, let's say for the last 200 years or so, why should we bother? It's a recent controversy. Do not be deceived. This has been going on since the beginning. Why should it be something that's so controversial? Because it makes such a difference in the way we live. This is really an important thing. And I am struck by the fact that in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, two of the very earliest letters of the Apostle Paul, we see evidence that the Apostle Paul talked about topics that we call eschatology, that is the doctrine of last things. He did not ignore this topic or considered that it was um, a detail that might be uh, divisive among Christians, so why bother to deal with it? No, 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 not at all. Now as we move into the passage that I want to look at this afternoon, which is in chapter 4, and we will spend time with willing, um, in the coming months, unless the Lord Jesus returns ahead of time, in which case um, I will not be preaching uh, at all from this pulpit, and I trust none of you will be here either. But if the Lord doesn't return, then we want to move through a number of paragraphs in 1 Thessalonians and in 2 Thessalonians, because these two letters really give a lot of information about uh, the topic that we're thinking about. Um, tonight we want to think about what will happen when Jesus returns for the church and how this should help us. What's going to happen? There are six things in our passage that I'd like to underscore and as we go through the list of six items I want to think about the practical usefulness of every one of those six points. What will happen when Jesus comes back? The next time we're together on this topic, we would like to think about when will he return for the church? And we'll be giving that a little more of a topical treatment. And then, as we go into the summer, Lord willing, we'll begin to think about what will happen after he returns, and how should we live in the light of all of this. So let's think about the first of those questions. What happens when Christ returns for the church? And we're going to defend the notion in this series that when we think about the return of Christ, we think about it in various phases. The Old Testament says that the Messiah is going to come. But the coming of the Messiah has, a, has at least two phases, his first coming and his second coming. The Bible talks about the fact that Jesus is going to return, and that has a number of phases as well. He is going to come for his church, and he's going to come with the church to set up his kingdom. And he's going to rule visibly on this earth for a thousand years, after which he will finally destroy the devil and all those rebels who remain at the end of the kingdom era. Um, 
when you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and you kind of get the feel of the, uh, the uh, motion of what Paul's talking about in this chapter. He focuses in on how the church is supposed to respond to various people in their world and how to live in the light of various events. If you look at the beginning of chapter 4, you'll see that he deals with the whole question of sexual purity. And he says in verse <coughs> chapter 1, uh, you know that um, how you're supposed to walk and to please God, you, you should abound in this more and more. Because the will of God, verse 3, is your sanctification. You are to be consecrated to God. And therefore, you are to abstain from fornication. That is, there should be no illicit sexual activity outside of marriage. Every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, in, in, of passionate desire, even as the Gentiles who do not know God. So you think about the way the Christian lives in, the, in a Gentile world that in that day and in our day follows after um, all kinds of uh, lustful passions, and the more extreme they are, the more bizarre they are, the more society seems to commend them. Paul says, in the Gentile world, live a sanctified life. Because, verse 7, God's not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. And so if you despise this command, you don't despise man, you despise God, who's given us his Holy Spirit. And then in verse 9, he talks about brotherly love. That's kind of another topic. How do you relate to your brethren in the church and in the world? Well, you take your own responsibility, he says in verses 9 and following, all the way through verse 12. You show your love for your brother by not expecting your brother to pay your bills. And apparently in the city of Thessalonica, there were people who thought that they were going to be very spiritual, and since Jesus was going to come back, perhaps in their own lifetime, they would have some kind of a, maybe a spiritual life conference um, out in, in some of the hills uh, to the north or west of Thessaloniki. Beautiful area there. You know, you can get a beautiful vista on the sea. You kind of sit there and kind of wait for Jesus to come back. And after a couple of hours, your stomach begins to grumble. And uh, um, if you do that for a day or two, you're, you're really hungry. And so maybe you ask for somebody to, you know, go down to the local church and see if anybody can bring up a picnic lunch. Because we, uh, holy people, are waiting for the return of Christ and having prayer meetings and Bible studies and thinking about what Paul told us. Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica and says, I told you when I was with you, do your own work. Verse 11, study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you that she may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that she have lack of nothing. Love your brethren by doing your own responsibility and not expecting your brethren to pay your bills. That is a demonstration of love for one another. So you learn how to live in the Gentile world. You're to learn how to live in the church. But there is another group of people that the Thessalonians were worried about, and that is those believing brethren who were no longer present in the church at Thessalonica because they had died. It's one thing to live in front of living Gentiles, and it's another thing to live in front of living believers, but what of believers who have, since the time of Paul's visit, passed off the scene? This is the reason why a question arose in Thessalonica. And he says in verse 13, by beginning a new paragraph, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Now, the Thessalonian church was not a Baptist church where some people are sleeping in either the front, middle, or rear pews or seats, has nothing to do with physical sleep. This is a nice way of talking about the reality of physical death. And that's very obvious, isn't it, in the rest of the passage. 
that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. It's obvious he's not talking about physical sleep. He's talking about what looks like a, a, a lasting sleep as people, people's spirit leaves and their body remains inert. And what he says here is that um, there were apparently living believers who wondered if the departure of now deceased believers would put them at a disadvantage when Christ returned for his people. I don't want you to be ignorant, he says, about um, these who are asleep. Don't be sorrowful like other people who uh, have no hope. Isn't that the case? Um, <laughs> it is very interesting this past week to see uh, the reaction of the, the world around uh, Raisi's death, the president of Iran who crashed, I guess it was during our last week's service in Iran, or in uh, the north of Azerbaijan, in that area, in the mountains. Um, I wonder if his family has hope. I wonder if other people really have hope. When you come right down to it, the, the, the people who believe that it is uh, by your own works that you are rescued, um, they don't really have too much hope. Not much confidence. A Christian feels a sense of loss when a believing loved one dies, but he doesn't grieve in the same way as those who have no hope. If you're a humanist who believes that when you die, you, you die like a dog, then if you're going to be consistent, you cannot believe that life has any ultimate meaning, and so you die without hope. A friend of ours in Luxembourg, who's an amateur astronomer, talked to us about this a number of times, and uh, yeah, he talks about being dead, and then he disappears, and there's this great void. There's, there's nothing. But he sure hopes that someone will remember him after he departs. And well, if you question him a little more closely, maybe there is something, but you can't know. There is no confidence, there is no hope, if one takes this view. If you are a religious man or woman, and you're convinced that your own goods, your own good works, are crucial to getting to heaven, then you may die in fear because you can never be sure if you have done enough works and if you have grown up in the Muslim faith, you have been taught that God is completely sovereign, essentially arbitrary. And even if you have respected the five pillars of Islam your whole life, if you present yourself to him at the final judgment and he says, go to hell, then that'll be good. And on the other hand, if you've been an immoral person and uh, maybe you've grown up in the Christian West and have violated the principles of Islam, if Allah at the final judgment says, go into paradise, that'll be good. You have no way of knowing ahead of time what your relationship with God is if you just depend upon man-made religion. But the Christian realizes that Jesus Christ has transformed death into nothing more fearsome than sleep. I don't want you to be ignorant, rather, concerning those who are asleep. Are you uh, afraid of going to sleep? When, when you go to bed at night, do you say, oh no, I'm going to fall asleep? Do you fear it? <coughs> I like going to sleep. And it generally doesn't take more than two or three minutes, and I'm out. Sleep's nice. And this is a euphemism for the reality of death, which is that state in which we are in the presence of the Lord. We are conscious. We don't believe the Bible teaches what Seventh-day Adventism teaches, that there is something called soul sleep, where you, a person at death is unconscious until the resurrection. 
the Bible indicates in a number of passages that when we are absent from the body, we're present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul says this in his letter to the Philippians. I have the desire to go and to be with the Lord. Nonetheless, for the believer, the horrors of death are swept away through Christ's death on the cross, and so it is no more intimidating than going to sleep. It's probably more fear-inspiring to think about the physical suffering you might have to go through before you die. But the Christian doesn't have to fear death, and someone who knows the Lord can pass from this body unalarmed. So, what of this question of believers who die before the return of Christ for the church? Look at verse 14. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and all Christians do, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. This is speaking about the return of Christ to set up his kingdom. Believers in Christ who have died will be brought back with Christ to rule and reign with him in the coming kingdom. So, how are they going to get to the, from the point where they die to the point where they return with Christ to rule and reign with him? Here's the answer, verse 15. This we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them, that is, precede them, which are asleep or have died. Then here's the explanation. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, with the, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now we want to go back over these verses and dig a little bit to meditate on their import. Verse 18 shows us that all of these words that we find in the preceding paragraph should be a source of comfort. The word comfort here can have two nuances, and they probably both belong with this word that Paul uses in his language in the first century. It can mean to bring comfort to those who are discouraged, and it can also mean to um, encourage or to, uh, to, to give a certain boldness. So it is a balm and it is a pet pill. <laughs> Those two things are put together in this term for comfort one another. Um, give comfort where there is grief and bring encouragement where there is fatigue. And so if we understand the truth of the resurrection of both deceased and living believers in Christ, we're supposed to pour comfort and courage into the wound of grief. Comfort softens the pain of the wound. And courage rehabilitates us so that we can keep walking despite the pain. If you have lost a close relative who knows the Lord but who doesn't? Or a close friend, you know the pain of grief. But if you have lost a close relative who knows the Lord, you grieve in a different way. There is comfort and courage when we think about this paragraph as it relates to us. And so let's go back over these six things that are going to happen uh, relating to the rapture of the church and think about how comfort and courage are brought to us. The first item that is mentioned in verse 16 is that the Lord will descend, that is, Jesus will descend from heaven. Jesus will descend from heaven. Now that's significant because the passage does not say that Jesus is going to send a representative like John the Baptizer to be a forerunner. That has already happened. It's not going to happen a second time in the same way. 
Jesus himself is going to come back. The Lord himself, it's underscored, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. Why does he descend from heaven? Why? Well, because today he is in heaven. He is not physically present with us. He is in the presence of the Father. He is seated at the right hand of the Father where he is preparing a place for his people. And at the moment that is ordained by the Father, Jesus himself will descend from heaven, coming in just the opposite direction from which he ascended 40 days after the resurrection. You say, well, where is heaven? If it's up for us in Spain, and for those on the other side of the earth, it's down, or you know, or in opposite direction. Where is heaven? I can't answer that question. But it is a place, apparently, outside this universe. And it is the place where he is today. It is the abode of the Father. Jesus is going to descend from there to our place in the solar system, however that ends up being. Where is there comfort and courage in this little statement, Jesus himself shall descend from heaven? I think there's tremendous encouragement and, and comfort here because Jesus keeps his promises. He always has. Jesus has never come to his people to say, uh, you know, I'm, so, I'm really sorry, I forgot that one. Or, you'll have to accept my apologies because that was just too difficult for me to do. He said to his disciples, he's going to go away to prepare a place for them. He's going to come back to take them to be with himself. And that gives us something to anticipate in a world where bad news captures the headlines and where there isn't a whole lot of good news. So when we get a little discouraged with things developing all around us, think about this promise. The Lord himself one day is going to descend from heaven. That is really going to happen. That's not just pie in the sky. It is an event that will happen in the sky. Let it capture your imagination. The apostles, you can see this from their writings, held out this promise that it could have been accomplished in their own day. There was an imminence about this expectancy of the Lord's return. And if it was true then, how much more today? The Lord himself will descend from heaven. Event number two, verse 16. He will descend from heaven with a what's the next word? Shout. Shout. I don't dare shout because that will hurt your ears. <laughs> Who's doing the shouting? With the voice of the archangel. An archangel will utter a shout. Who's the archangel? We don't really know. There is one archangel that is mentioned in Scripture. His name is Michael, the angel in charge of the people of Israel, according to Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, and Jude 9. Michael, the archangel, he is called, had a debate over the body of Moses after he died, where he would be buried. Maybe it's Michael. There is no definite article here in the original text. It doesn't say the archangel. The voice of the archangel in the Greek text there is no definite article and so it could be an arch an archangel that may be several who are superior in rank whoever it is this will a little bit be a little bit like um, let's say the Joint Chiefs in the American military arrangement the Joint Chiefs of Staff who call an honor guard to attention all around the world for the American army at the same time. Now, I don't know the intricacies of the Spanish military. Um, are there any specialists here on how Spain it, operates militarily? I didn't think so. 
We're all kind of foreigners here this afternoon. But imagine the head of the military force of any particular country who was able to send out a WhatsApp and, and that calls every person in the military uniform to immediate attention, uh, watch this spot because I'm going to give you a directive. The archangel is not going to shout for Jesus to come. The shout will call believers to come to their Savior. And this term denotes great authority. It is not a shout that you hear in a rock concert. That's, that's ridiculous. Nor is it a scream of horror. Oh no! It is a shout of command. It's like the general who calls his troops. It is used in the secular literature of the day, this term, for a charioteer who shouts to excite his horses. Go faster! Avante! Or it is the shout of a hunter who urges forward his hunting dogs. I'm not a hunter. I don't know what a hunter says to his hunting dogs, but maybe it's a whistle or some other kind of command. You, the dogs know that the owner of the dogs must go and sniff out the prey. It is used of a skiff captain that energizes his rowers. You've seen these guys in the galleys. Hey, up, up, and counts out the rhythm. And there's an authoritative command. That, that's the idea here. The archangel comes with a shout. Where is their comfort and courage in this little phrase? If you spend time with a grieving person, you will know that the last thing that the grieving person wants to hear is a shout. But if a friend quietly reassures us that the one we have lost through death and who sleeps can be awakened by the archangel's shout, if he or she is a believer in Christ, then we realize that the death of the body is a temporary thing. Now you and I can't do this. Try going to a morgue or a funeral home and someone's laid out in the casket. I don't know what the habits are here. The one funeral that I have attended in Spain uh, was closed casket. No one at the service uttered a shout to order the man in the box to open it up from the inside and climb out. This is completely absurd. But the witness of Scripture is that believers whose body has even decayed and disappeared into dust and that we could not possibly reconstitute. At the shout of the archangel, those bodies will be resurrected. Some of the living may be deaf, but the dead are not. And when the angel calls, there isn't anybody who's going to say, I didn't hear that. Would you please repeat that? And one of the painful things about grief is the aloneness that we feel. But when the archangel shouts and brings us to attention, we're going to realize in a new way that we were not alone at all. We will have been only one among millions who went through the valley of grief sustained by God's grace and I don't know about you but when I position myself in that picture of something much bigger than I am that's going on where God is fulfilling his purposes that gives me comfort and courage and it's designed to do so so the Lord Jesus is going to descend from heaven with a shout uh, 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 he's going to descend from heaven an archangel is going to utter a shout thirdly God's trumpet will sound. End of verse 16. With the trump of God. I've told you on another occasion back in the 1980s, King Juan Carlos, 
from Spain visited the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg, and uh, it was interesting to watch this state visit. I was part of a choir that was invited to sing for him and uh, his wife. And we were standing there waiting for his arrival on the stands. And uh, of course, there were a lot of other people seated out where you sit and watch the event, but Juan Carlos and his wife, his Greek wife, were not yet there, nor was the Grand Duke Jean and uh, Grand Duchess uh, Josephine. And we kind of looked at our watches and, uh, you know, when is he going to show up? And some people could peer out the front windows of the Hotel de Ville. Oh, they've got the red carpet out. And oh, look, look, the, the, the limousine is coming now. And then he gets out and he walks down the red carpet. And of course, it's all, you know, state visits are filled with pomp and ceremony as they are all around the world. And we're standing there waiting for him to come up the stairs. And while we're waiting, and the king is invisible downstairs, there are three or four men in the corridor in a, a very elegant set of stairs that has a, it's like an echo chamber. And there are two trumpets and two trombones. And when the king starts going up the stairs, these guys let it loose with the Wilhelmus. Bam, 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 bam. Well, I won't sing you the whole Wilhelmus. I mean, it, I can't imitate a trumpet. And of course, it was four part harmony. And I just give everybody the shivers. Grand Duke Jean and his wife had heard this thing a million times, and they could probably sing it backwards. But if you have any kind of patriotic feeling as a Luxembourg, the Wilhelmus just really does it for you. And every country has a little tune like that, that is majestic, and that is played with trumpets, because this is an elemento, right? And that's what this says, that there is going to be a trumpet of God you know, even in the Roman times, there was something called the Emperor's Trumpet Call, the Classicum, which would be sounded to summon citizens for an assembly if the Emperor was present. And if you're a citizen, you recognize that little tune. Oh, we've got to show up here because their Emperor is here and we're all warmly invited. And that is a a little bit of an echo of what the creator of the universe is going to do when he gathers the citizens of his kingdom, a trumpet's going to sound. There's comfort and courage here as well, because if trumpets suggest royalty, um, isn't it incredible that the majestic king that this trumpet's going to announce is also a merciful and gracious savior? We went downstairs to the Hotel de Ville, the town meeting room there, Ajunamiento, and the queen came down and greeted us. She was a very personal, personal friend, and the king was spending time somewhere else. The king wouldn't come down and greet the choir. You know, I mean, the choir is just a little bit of entertainment on the side. And I'm sure that the queen didn't remember anything about us. She was used to doing her work, like all royalty is used to doing their work. They are PR for their country. It's all about diplomatic relationships. But when Jesus, the King of the universe, comes at the sound of the trumpet, he's not coming to a mass of faces that are unknown to him. Juan Carlos, if you passed him in the street, even if you had sung for him the week before, he would never know who you are. But if you pass the Lord Jesus in the street, he would want to sit down with you for a heart to heart talk because he already knows you by name. And he also knows what you're thinking about and what your struggles are and knows your future. And not only that, despite all the things that you'd want to hide from him or never admit to, 
He is willing to give up his life blood for you at the cross for all those things. So that the trumpet announces royalty with all who cares for you. That's amazing. That's amazing. Have you thanked him for that? The king who's going to make his entrance at the trumpet sound is no tyrant. He's the good shepherd. And you need to make your peace with him if you have not already done so. You see this in the Old Testament when the people of Israel were convened by God at Mount Sinai in Exodus 19. There's a trumpet that sounds. And uh, Mount Sinai, the Jewish people, were placed under the Mosaic Covenant. And the, the law that they submitted to promise they, the, the law they submitted to promised death to violators. It, it was a fearsome, awesome, menacing trumpet call that was associated with the curse of disobedience. But here is a trumpet call that is not associated with death for disobedience. It is a trumpet call of victory. This last trumpet that Paul refers to also in 1 Corinthians 15, 52 is like the ancient war trumpets in Greek and Roman times which sounds the end of battle and summons the scattered troops to camp. How many of you have served in the, in the, in the military somewhere? I know Ronald has, and John. Um, I don't know if they still do this. I assume that when you're in basic training, there's a bugler who sounds out a certain tune. Right? Or these tunes all have a significance. And you don't have to know the words. I guess there are no words. It's just a tune. And the tune means this is what you're supposed to do next. And if when they're playing taps, you decide it's time to get up for breakfast, you're wrong. There was a tune that was played in Greek and Roman times that said, battle's over, guys, you can come back and, uh, and eat. We're finished for the day. You, you see this even in 2 Samuel 18, where uh, troops were called back together. Or in 2 Samuel 20, you see this. And this is very much like what's going to happen when the, the archangel sounds the trumpet. It means that the armies of the church are to be gathered to the commander-in-chief. This is the end of the watch. It's time to be called in for dinner. And that's kind of neat, I think, that we can anticipate this because it's really going to happen one day. Item number four, end of verse 16. The dead in Christ shall rise first. That means that all those who are in Christ, that is those from the day of Pentecost to the day when Christ returns for his church, they are those who are in Christ. They are part of the body of Christ. They are a unique group that began on the day of Pentecost, not in the Garden of Eden, not when God made a covenant with Abraham, not when God made a covenant with Moses or David. This is those who are in Christ. They have placed their trust in Christ. They're part of the body. Those who are in Christ and are dead will rise first. Can you imagine the hundreds of millions of departed believers over the centuries? Where have the atoms of their decayed bodies gone? Of course, this is a, a frequent uh, uh, critique, isn't it, by skeptics and atheists that the whole notion of the resurrection of Jesus is impossible. The resurrection of anybody is impossible. How can you have a body decay into dust and even the bones, you know, disappear? Or what about people who were lost at sea and are eaten by animals or... Uh, people are lost in war and uh, their bodies are burned or they're blown to bits. I mean, how are you going to reconstitute that? Um, I have some good news for you. And here it is. It's not our problem. Because the resurrection of the body is something that God is going to do by his own means and he hasn't given us the recipe. But the claim is clear. 
people who have been consciously present with Christ in heaven will find their spirits are joined to new bodies and they will rise from the earth to heaven. They will rise first. I don't have a particular problem with that. If God can make the world out of nothing, let there be light. Bing! And there's light. Four days later, let's make that light into sun, moon, and stars. You can imagine what is required to do such a thing on command. If God can do that, I guess he can reconstitute a dead body and make it into an eternal body. And God doesn't even get tired doing that. The believing loved one that you last saw racked with pain and maybe wasted away to a shadow of himself or herself before he passed into eternity, he's going to get a new body that will never weaken or sicken again. That is God's commitment. And this truth brings us comfort and courage when we are in hand-to-hand -hand combat with suffering and, and grief. The disfigurement of disease and suffering are temporary. Now, two other things on the list. Here's item number five. We see it in verse 17. Living believers also will be caught up in the clouds with those who have been raised from the dead. Did you see that? End of verse 16. The dead in Christ shall rise first, then, that is sequential, we which are alive and remain, that is, we have not yet died, shall be caught up together with them, the them is those who are dead in Christ, who have risen, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now, there are all kinds of implications in this little sentence, and we will go back to this, uh, Lord willing, in future times together. But there are a couple of things I'd like to underscore. Number one, there will be people at some point in history who will not die. They will be believers in Christ who will pass from the present natural condition. Maybe they'll be fairly young people. Maybe there will be there'll be old people on their deathbed. And many in between who will move from the natural body to the resurrection body without having died. And there is precedence for that in Old Testament scripture. We think about um, Enoch in the book of Genesis, who was not because Moses says God took him, Genesis chapter 5. How did that happen? I guess one day Enoch was there, and the next day he was gone. God took him away. There's been a lot of speculation about what will be the accompanying circumstances. The, the word that's used here, they shall be caught up together, we referred to that last time we were together, uh, harpazo, means to snatch away, to catch away. And the Latin translation of this passage in 1 Thessalonians 4 uses the word rapturo, which is the word from which we get the word rapture, the catching away of the church. So there are dead believers in Christ who are raised from the dead, and immediately thereafter, there are those who are still alive and remain, will be snatched away with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So this is not talking about Christ coming to earth, but a, an encounter between believers in Christ and the Lord in the air. There is no indication in this passage that they immediately come back to rule and reign. What is stated is that they will always be with the Lord. And that is our last point. That all believers will forever be with the Lord in resurrected bodies. So wherever the Lord Jesus is, we'll be there. If we put the pieces together in the way that I, I believe is correct, we begin that eternal existence in the presence of Christ with a time when our works will be examined at the Bema Sea Judgment. There's going to be judgment on the earth where God takes care of his people, the Jews, and purifies them so that the nation is brought to himself. 
And at the same time, he's going to judge living nations for how they respond to the Jews. It's coming a time of incredible anti-Semitism that is going to make the day we live in today look like a kindergarten, a kindergarten party. And uh, people will have to make a, a, a given account of how they respond to the needs of the Jewish people, according to Matthew chapter 25. But that first time that we are with the Lord is going to be a time of examination. We will be with him. We'll be with him when he returns to set up his kingdom. We're going to rule with him. We're caught up in the clouds, and we will forever be with the Lord in resurrected bodies. Quite a number of years ago, there were a number of men who wrote pop fiction about the rapture of the church. Films were made about this, suggesting that if the rapture happened, your body would disappear, but your clothes would remain. It was kind of an intriguing speculation, isn't it? I guess they say, well, when the Lord Jesus resurrected from the dead, his burial sheets were left in the tomb, as if they had collapsed on a body that was no longer inside them. And so the inference is then that when we are resurrected to be with Christ, uh, shirt and tie and Susan socks and, and just whoop, falls into a heap. I don't know if it's going to happen that way. And it really doesn't matter. The passage that uh, it does speak about this, and it's very clear that those who remain are going to be taken up to be with those who have died in Christ and resurrected. And so the rapture is the resurrection of the church. It is, by definition, that point in time where believers in Christ, from the day of Pentecost to the day when Christ returns for his church, receive eternal bodies. That's what the rapture is for. And if that doesn't happen, then you and I are condemned either to die and remain dead, or to live around in the body you've got now. which, depending upon your age, may leave you more or less discouraged. <laughs> the great thing about this passage is the very end, right? So shall we ever be with the Lord. So shall we ever be with the Lord. That means always, without interruption. We will never be or feel distant from his presence. We will be together again where Jesus will be, we will be. And the best thing about heaven will be to see the Lord as he is. The, one of the fringe benefits will be that we will no longer be separated from those who passed on before us and whom uh, we love. And we'll be able to interact with them and I guess have conversation. We'll have to wait and see how that all works out. Quite a number of years ago, Kathy and I attended a wedding. French lady married to an American businessman, and they had set up a little business in the north of France, in Bourgogne, and uh, was a going business, brought a lot of employment to the area, don't know if it's still going, but after the wedding, we uh, attended a reception, and we were sitting across the table from an uncle of the bride, and this man had just lost his wife just become a widower. And uh, at the table, when we were talking back and forth, he was lamenting the passing of his wife, who was a, uh, I guess, a dear lady. These were not believing people. And from across the table, there was a young lady who was a friend of the bride, who tried to comfort the old man. And she said to him, Vous savez, Mourir, ça fait partie de la vie. Which in Chinese means, <laughs> you know, death is part of living. And, and she had no other words to encourage him. That was the end of it. You know, old man, uh, you want to live, you're going to have to 
Get ready to die. No hope. Life ends in death. Basta. I don't remember how that man responded. He was seated right beside me. I, I don't think he was greatly encouraged. Kind of took it to, as a, yeah, sure, I mean, you said what is obvious. What an empty comfort that must have been for that man. I wish I could have had an hour at the um, reception. It was not appropriate to do so. To open my Bible, which I did not have in hand, and to say, I, I, I want to show you this passage. Because if you are in Christ, you don't have the same outlook that the world has on life and death. Because you have this hope that Christ has returned for his church. If you're in Christ, whether you die and have a reconstituted, resurrected body when Christ returns for you, or whether you're still alive and are instantly changed and are caught up to be with previously dead people in the presence of the Lord, that's where you're going. And if you believe that's true, then you comfort one another with these words. You pour comfort into grief and you give encouragement to one another. This life is not all there is. We're living for something far greater that goes beyond these few short years. These are not just empty words. They are the truth. And so God wants us, as we read passages like this, to let the words sink in and capture our imagination and our faith, our trust in him, and keep looking up when maybe our heart says, look down. Father, we thank you for these promises. We believe that they are true. We look forward to the time when Christ is going to refer, is going to return for his church. Maybe it's going to be very soon indeed. And you have said that the one who has this hope in him purifies himself, even as the Lord Jesus is pure. Help us to live that way this week, we pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name.